Angels Speak The first Indian oracle book of channeled healing messages and affirmations written by our guest today Roshni Shehnaz Hello and welcome to Rabe Rashi Foundation Roshni is an international eminent spiritual medium well-being happiness coach DN DNI coach founder of holistic well-being and meher roshni foundation absolutely wow this is aapka bahut bahut swagat hai roshni thank you rashi and uh, blessings to you and all involved so nice the name itself is so beautiful roshni sabko jagana this is absolutely wonderful okay roshni can you share your journey on becoming a spiritual medium medium kya hota hai but i you tell me in detail who are the real mediums you know and how it has influenced your advocacy for wellness and happiness in life uh, yes the entire uh, onus of my journey actually lies in that name a lot because uh, my birth name is shanaz and that's why you see the suffix in my name roshni shanaz and uh, roshni as a name was gifted to me by my beloved god master guru anything that you can call meher baba whose last living mandli whose name was bhau kalchuri bhau ji as fondly called by everyone in the meher baba community so bhau ji gave me this name as a gift of meher baba on 11th of march 2012 now going back to it uh, on a quick note that i come from a 20 plus years of uh, film and media journey at that point in time in 2010 when i started off on my spiritual path so uh, worked with the best of the production houses and uh, god's grace led me through from one place to the other for years you will not believe uh, that i never ever had a uh, physical bio data because one job led to the other and there was never a need i didn't even have my showreels for uh, you know time when somebody asks way uh, later in life that okay aapka kaam uh, kuch dekh sakte hai and i was like oh i never kept anything you know but yes of course a few things were there but the grace of god that held me through all of those years with all the ups and downs especially coming from a lower middle class parsi zoroastrian family where media dur dur se 50 generations back and forth <laughs> nobody was aware of or connected to so it was almost uh, getting on to the bullhorns and you know uh getting on my own and then i completely uh give the honor and gratitude to god's grace which led me through all those years i've been like a major party animal but even though being that i never drank or smoked ever nobody and uh, today peer pressure or anything is so quick to get on to that oh boss said this so i had one or oh, friend uh, pushed me so i had but something was holding me through and it never felt on moralistic oh i'm a good girl no and when anybody said that oh such a good girl you don't drink i said no, no no i'm not a good girl i'm mad and crazy but i just don't fancy it i'm high on life and that's what my life was wanting to be a filmmaker wanting to go to the cans wanting to go win at the film fair at some point in time and my journey from advertising to television to films uh, led me with all of these years and then i was head of films at balaji telefilms when after the release of kya phool hai hum when we all were basking in the glory of its uh, you know the first part when it released and uh, the super hit that it became in july uh, 2005 26 july when the floods hit mumbai we all were about 15 odd who kind of you know uh, took up charge and held hands and walked through and waded through all those waters from balaji to lokhanwala where i lived at that point in time and the next day in fact i sent out hundreds of messages for the doxy cyclone or whatever that you know the tablet was but by the time i had to get one there weren't any uh, the chemist then after about a month or so just at ganesh chaturthi i had these symptoms and i collapsed and was uh, diagnosed with leptospirosis so that's where the journey of my turnaround of life began 
I got that, I came out of it. And again, I got a relapse within a month and then started almost a year plus of journey of becoming a medical guinea pig of sorts. So I got on where I was hospitalized. I was put on to wrong medication. Things were not diagnosed. I went through like 256 tests that had no result or diagnosis, forget prognosis at all. And nobody knew whether I would come out of it or not. But something inside me, that voice inside me said it was not over. And at that point in time, I, uh, you know, I was very connected to Ganesha right from childhood. And in fact, this year is, was my 24th year of Ganesh Chaturthi at home, which started in the year 2000. And I just knew that it's not over. But I thought at that time, Are yaar, abhi tak nahi banai hai. so <laughs> I can't be going anywhere. I didn't know when I would come out of it, but I knew that I will. And yes, God's grace took me through where uh, people came into my life, whereby I was got out of that situation. I started healing. I recovered and got back to life and started freelancing and so on. Then early 2009, 2008, December, 2000, early 2009, I started getting these, uh, you know, uh, things which were completely arbit. Now, I never had a guru or some mentor to ask things about in its literal sense. So I couldn't ask anyone, what is this happening? And there were several symptoms that took place, which I had no clue for. And I started getting these random messages for people in my energetic circle. So a friend, but somebody I may not have spoken to for last six months also, but is in my energy radar of sorts kind of a thing. And I would get, okay, tell this person uh, he won't get a job. So not to resign right now or arbitrarily to somebody who is not getting married and not getting a person also due to whatever reasons saying that uh, your marriage is on July 8th this year, coming year, you know. So I just didn't know what was happening. Of course, I held back. But I saw that when I held back, I was almost pushed out to say that to you. So if something has come up for you and I'm holding back and not saying, how can I tell Rashi this? You know, it's so abrupt and she will ask me why the hell would I tell something or ask something like that? And I would hold it back. And sometime if we are in conversation, it would be as if somebody is pushing that voice out and I just cannot hold it kind of a thing. And that went on. And then in 2010, it uh, got more solid. I had a friend who gave me an angel book. I still hold a very dear, though we are not in touch. But uh, through uh, that book, uh, I just flipped over some pages at times. And then somewhere it got connected to that these beings are there who are possibly, you know, uh, coming more closer towards us rather than we going closer towards them to help us in life in some way or the other. And then uh, it so happened that uh, there was this workshop. Now, by the time that 2010 came up, uh, the whole 2009, I was struggling with all of this. And when 2010 came up, I was in complete ground zero in my medical debts and survival debts. So I had about 72 lakhs of hospital debts which were taken through several loans at that time how god got me those loans also i'm amazed when i retrospect and all of those institutional and bank loans that were there plus i had a house loan a home loan that was already going on so along with that i was almost close to one cr of debt and with sleepless nights of what would i do because i never had any kind of money background or you know father's money inherited money nothing and I would just keep praying when I would sit blank and saying Ganpati Baba please tell me what to do you know and uh, then it came about that I need to sell that house and that space God had gifted me to buy in my good times only so that it would help me in this time and with great difficulty, I was trying to come to terms with that and fathom with that. It didn't sell. 32 brokers, over nine months of showing my house in 2009, it wasn't selling. And then when all these messages of self-healing were coming up with other messages of how I need to clear my childhood garbage, how I need to clear resentments or hurts that I was holding and so many things. At that time it came, I need to free the house. I need to cut my cords with the house so that it can go and bless somebody else. 
And that's when I started praying. And in 2010, I had closed off everything and gone to ground zero. I had closed on to even go out from the party person that I was, the social person that I was. I had completely shut down and I had stopped going out and all. And at that time, I just got a job which was six months old. And I kept on getting this, leave the job, leave the job. And I was like, what the hell, leave the job? Like, what will I do? Leave the job. I'm just about to sell the house and go zero. And one fine day on May 10th, I woke up and I just gave a handwritten resignation in my office that I'm not coming from tomorrow. I didn't know who pushed that. And then 15 days later, it sinked in that I don't have a job. And then started the journey where my spiritual path started opening up more and more. And in August uh, 2010, I had this uh, dream in uh, July, actually. I had this dream where I'm seeing myself with a lot of people in front of me, youngsters, and I'm sitting on a, you know, next to a table. I don't know that place or anything. There's no audio in that dream, but I'm talking and I know I'm addressing a crowd and I just keep it that way. I don't know what to make of it. So I leave it. And then three weeks later in August, I uh, get a call from my dear friend Meghna Gai because maximum of my years in the media has been with Mukta Arts since 1996 that I joined as assistant director to Mr. Gai. Meghna called me over because I was involved with Whistling Woods when it was in the making. And then I had just left after it was done and joined Balaji. So I had not seen the campus as such in full form with its completeness. So I went to meet her, we chatted, and then we explored that why don't you come and teach over here and things like that. And I put it at the back of my head that, okay, I will think about it. And she had a meeting and I went on to see the campus. And while I was going through with a colleague to see the campus, we entered a space which is called our foundation hall as of the campus. And that was the place in my dream. I'd never seen the foundation hall or the full campus before. And that's when I got it, take this job. And my journey started where I started teaching at Whistling Woods. I was not in that 20 hour job in a media, but I was still a part of it, giving my experience back into the society of sorts and giving time whereby I had time after my teaching hours to pursue my spiritual calling. And that's where the journey started and opened up to guide me to be a professional healing medium. And now the reason being the word medium is that I was guided right from the onset that I will never use the word healer as a noun. Because healer is only one. And that is the power above. And we all are vehicles, instruments, and mediums of that power, which are allowed and given the opportunity. We are not special or gifted and so on. We all have that within us. It is just that somebody has ordained in a particular birth to open up that and pursue it and work towards it. Or somebody has kept it dormant for lifetimes and will decide whenever to do that. So there is nothing special about us. But the aspect of only that we have ordained to utilize the gift for whatever reasons that divinity has given the opportunity for. I want to tell all my listeners, there's a different kind of an energy on the show today. And I think it is the purity and it is the simplicity because God resides in the simple things of this life. You can just look through her. And this is beautiful, you know, it's making me teary. <laughs> Wonderful. So nice that we connected. Okay. So, you know, we understand that you are the medium, the ambassador for the well-being. Sabke bhalai mein aap rehte ho. Sabke liye achcha karte ho. Aapke hisaab se, what do you think are the different kinds of initiatives and projects, organizations should, you know, uh, embed in the system and um, especially to promote mental health, well-being, you know, for the employees, for the employee families. Thank you so much, Rashi, for this question, because it is a very, very poignant one in today's time, especially. It always was, but it is more important today because uh, people would say, why corporate? Why not an individual? But today, all individuals, whether it's a labor or anyone, is connected to a corporate house, which is driving the economy of our lives. The money energy is being driven and held over there. Now, imagine 
what worried, depleted, sad, unhealthy souls would do when working for these organizations which are driving the economy of the world or leadership of the world. And thereby, today, you know, all these years uh, when I've done corporate sessions and corporate workshops, the first question is, okay, can it be done in a two-hour thing? Acha, acha, maximum uh, three-hour thing. Can you do a one-hour session? Microsoft Seekne ke liye, they have four days workshop. But well-being ke liye, they have one hour to spare. So our sense of priorities have been warped. And COVID became a big karmic teacher. But sadly, we still not have learned. There are corporates who are waking up to this fact. There is a sense of, you know, conscious leadership that has awakened through it, whereby people are becoming aware. And I have worked with a few corporates like that. One majorly being, uh, you know, Datamatics, uh, which is there, which truly, and I have seen them all these last few years, right from 2020, that I'm connected with them, of how the entire you know, resource, human resources department is truly involved with the well-being of each and every employee, realizing and understanding that their productivity drives the company. It is like who is buttering the bread and on which side. So if we do not realize that it is this lot that we need to cajole, we need to take care of. Today, we are compartmentalized in so many different ways. We live uh, in the window of the emotional uh, aspect, physical aspect, mental aspect, spiritual aspect. Spiritual to zero, 5% of people live in that. But these three primary windows we are living in, if you draw a four-windowed column as our normal window. Now, you are physically present here. In school times, teacher used to throw a chalk at us and say, you are physically present, mentally absent, right? What does that mean? Because I'm sitting here. I may be sitting in the seminar, but my mind is jogging. Oh my God, emotional would be, oh my God, I phone silent. Pe rakh diya. Mere bete ka phone aega abhi. Right? Physical, I'm in ache and pain. Oh my God, I'm sitting since so long. When will the seminar get over? So we are fragmented. And wellness is not just when something is wrong. Wellness actually is preventive and not curative. We take it as curative because that's how our mind conditioning and wiring is. Unless we are falling off the valley, we don't want to rappel. But if we tie that rope around and go down the mountain, then we will may not fall. So the aspect is that if organizations can prioritize wellness programs, Flexible work arrangements for women or gender-based or otherwise also, you know. Keep some sort of recreational exercise meditative area which is cornered in the organization whereby people can take maybe a power nap, just go and pray, meditate, irrespective. This is not religious. This is completely irreligious. Spirituality is about energy. You don't need to believe in any God, nothing at all. If you believe that you exist five feet, good enough to begin with. So the organizations need to bring in meditation or mindfulness programs. People do not understand what mindfulness. All this is largely also, people say, spiritual jargon of the new age. But let's break it down. If I am reading a book and so engrossed in the character that I don't know what is happening around me, it's meditation. It's mindfulness. So my work has always been to cut through the jargon and put onto the platter in simplistic ways with analogies and with things that can help the most, you know, ground level grassroots person understand the doability and the implementation of the simple action. So I am telling my rickshaw driver that stop doing this, stop whining over this. Aap sirf ye socho, ye hai, aur socho ke ye ho gaya hai. It is as simple as that. And then tum karo na. Why mein baad mein samjhati hoon tumhe. So he may not understand the high level thing. But just helping him to get that conviction at that lower level. So when organizations try to dive deep 
into the essence of that being who is working for eight hours, six hours, whatever it is, then the results of that so-called bottom line will be completely different. Longevity, retainable uh, aspect of employees, loyalty, all of those will become game changers. Community engagement and social activities, professional development opportunities, creating, I had done a workshop called the intrapreneurs. There are so many people who have ingenious ideas, but they don't have finances or capacity or confidence to create their own companies or become entrepreneurs. So if there is a FMCG, for example, and a product related company, if they create a competition every year for these ingenious minds and whoever wins leads that project, you create entrepreneurs within your company and you don't need to get people outside from fan with fancy salaries to do the same thing and then maybe create a team that would back it up. So there are several things, including physical fitness initiatives, you know, employee assistance programs on emotional well-being counseling. Like for one of the companies, I have been an in-house counselor and well-being coach, where every Wednesday I would I was on a retainer every month, and we would have an every Wednesday well-being Wednesday, where employees can take 15 or 20 minute, uh, 30 minute sessions as a personal counseling for me, and it would be completely confidential. And then once a month, we would do group sessions for different departments, for admin, for sales, according to what the HR wants to achieve out of them. And we would design the wellness program of that month according to the requisites and the specialities. So these kind of things, you know, bringing leadership training on well-being, not leadership training on mechanical things and how to make money and how to pitch sales only. Because if he is emotionally disturbed with ten, uh, five people uh, ill in his house and going through emotional disturbance of a divorce and things like that, where is leadership training going to take him? Unless it is for his well-being. And last but not the least, appreciation and recognition. My class teacher, Mrs. Rodriguez, bless her soul, would always say, appreciate in public, reprimand in private. And that I feel is a big, again, a game changer for corporates because there is so much of thrashing. There's so much of public humiliation sometimes that happens, putting down people. We always know that we can go ahead by erasing the other line rather than increasing our own line through our merit. So if these kind of things people can see, people can differentiate bullying kind of leadership, segregate them, into, in fact, making them heal as well rather than throwing them out, I would say. So these are a few things that I feel organizations can do and create a holistic approach, which also will deal with diversity and inclusion, which is also, I'm a coach of DNI, which you said. Are angels for real? Tell us more about Angel Speak, your book. Then, and how does angel soul therapy intersect with the other roles that you are doing, you know, contributing to the spiritual and personal growth? So let's hear. That's a very, very uh, cute and innocent question that many, many people have, uh, Rashi. And in my book, Angels Speak, I have written about this part that we all feel that angels are coming Where were they before this? Where are they coming and no, of course, they've always been there right from the time that creation was created. But it has been in these last few decades of the spiritual push that the universe, that the inhabited world is getting from the divine force, from the divine power, from the scientific power, if so to speak, for people who believe only in science, that there is an energetic push which is bringing these subtle energies closer to the inhibited world. And these were always there, again, as mediums, as messengers, between that higher power, whatever name that you may call it, and us on planet Earth. And in these few decades, because of that spiritual energetic push of this advent of time, these subtle beings have been made to come closer and closer to the earthly realms, to guide us, to bring us back on track, and to help us to lead the lives which are more aligned, which are more centered, which are more grounded. 
for the age that we are moving in, for the dimension that we are moving in. There's a phenomenon called the photon energy. People can read about it. And scientifically, the aspect of the photon energy has created this. Though spiritually, there is another aspect altogether of the advent of this time. So when this energies, these energies started coming towards us, the faculties of people who were empaths or sensitive or had ordained in their incarnation or living times. So there were visionaries earlier also, but there would be one in thousand. Earlier, people would sit for 40 days and 400 days and then you would experience something. Earlier, there would be one child prodigy out of thousands. But in today's time, if you see, this has become vast. And the reason being that divinity requires this army now, not just those one or two lieutenant generals and majors. It requires a fleet of people to do good at all levels of consciousness and reach out to every denomination, right from peon to president. And these angels are a religious in their literal sense. So they don't belong to any religion or has got nothing to do with following a religion. They are energetic connections of each soul. So all of us by default as a soul, even if people who don't believe in reincarnation or people who don't believe in karma, I always say whether I or you believe it or not, energy is existing and it's doing its job. I either take that toolbox and utilize it for my good and benefit or I leave the toolbox to rust and say, I don't believe there ever is a toolbox. And that's fine. But it does exist in its own capacity and its own existence. So utilizing this toolbox, which contains these messengers of God, which are the angels. So we all have two guardian angels, at least. And then there are realms. So just as chairman, manager, general manager, and so on downline in the corporate, so is in the corporatization of, sorry, the corporate aspect of the hierarchy of divinity. That these archangels govern the guardian angels and all other divine beings, which do all the groundwork with us. So when our energy connects with these subtle beings to guide us, to help us to live that ordained path, otherwise you and I don't remember Today, everything that we go through is a cycle of expression and experience. An expression could be a seed coming from this or another lifetime. Experience is the resultant energy or the outcome of that expression that I had done. But when I am incarnating, I am only first getting the experience. So somebody slapped me. That's the experience. So I get angry. Why the hell did she slap me and she did this to me? I never did anything to her. And I'm such a kind person. I never hit a fly in my life but not knowing that the seed of this lies in an expression somewhere which I have to nullify. And therefore I may have hate, resentment and so on. And then I add on the karma to nullify that. But when I'm guided by angels, by energy work, by divinity, by the powers above, then I can learn or harness the innate you know, energy of forgiveness, of love that we all are, but we have kept that dormant. So they become the guiding force. They become the GPS system. But the driving we have to do. So I tell everyone, whoever clients and all, when students in our workshops, that anybody can walk with you, behind you, in front of you, but nobody can walk for you. So taking these divine beings as your GPS, you steer your way through the turbulence and roller coasters and lanes and twists and turns and potholes of life so that you can be more aware and lead a more conscious life doing what is right. And whenever that choosing comes, I always say that to choose the easy or to choose the comfort, choose what is right over it. 
and that's what life becomes thereafter. The book actually happened much later than the messages that came about. So in 2010, I was guided to start a Facebook page and uh, made to write these daily messages, energetic messages and affirmations, which I would be putting out. Then in 2011, I was guided that this will become a book for posterity, for people to heal and be guided in their lives and be a potent source that can remain with every individual for all their life. And I was guided to uh, speak to my uh, then uh, publishers, Life Positive, which were not into publishing. And cutting the chase, when I approached, they said, we don't do publishing and we are just a magazine. And I said, I don't know. I got in my guidance that you would publish my book. So I've just approached. And then cut to 2015, things steered and I sat with patience. So for me, when any guidance comes, Rashi, I implicitly eat, breathe, sleep, live it. No questions asked. So if I'm guided, this will happen. I don't get put up. When will it happen? Why is it not happening? Are you kuchni hora? Guidance is wrong. No. Guidance is never wrong. Timelines will be different for each individual of when it will manifest. And then the book manifested in 2016. January is our anniversary, in fact, for the launch of the book. It went into the world and this is the book. There are miraculous uh, stories behind how it came about also because by the time I got the email, I had six week weeks to submit the book. And I just said a yes, not realizing what would, how I would put the book together. And then I was also guided that it would have 15 illustrations of the archangels the 15 key archangels like archangel michael archangel gabriel and so on and i was like okay and the story is there in the book of how it all happened where my dear uh, student somya gupta a beautiful artist came about with all these illustrations which are in the book which can be preyed upon for the qualities of the archangel to heal your life and these were done through distance channeling where I channeled the energies and uh, guided her of what came about. And then she put it into illustration with intuitively the prayer that was given to her of what more came about to put it into action. And that's how each of these beautiful illustrations are there in the book. And the book has 365 messages and healing affirmations that can be used as day one, day two chronologically, or it can be used as an oracle. Oracle means it has got potent energy and you can ask a question and flip the book and it'll open up to the answer that you need to get. Or you can intend the question and ask the angels to guide you to a number between 1 to 365. And whatever number pops up, you go and see that day number and see the message that is there. And to resonate the healing, you need to do the affirmation for a certain period of time, which is written in the book on how to use the book. And that's how the entire book came about. I have several people who have sent photographs where they have kept it with their Bible, with their Gita and several other such religious, uh, you know, and pious uh, books in their life. So I can just be ever grateful that God, my Meher Baba made me the medium to allow this work to flow through me and get out into the world. And I will always be thankful to Life Positive for being that pillar support in getting it out into the world. The book is available in few stores and also available on Amazon, Flipkart and uh, so on. And right now I am praying since few years that we find an international publisher to publish it for the worldwide footprint as well. And, you know, you just said this at 444. Jai Baba. <laughs> <laughs> this is commendable. Doing welfare is one thing. and sorting people's lives is another thing you know and you're actually sorting it without you even knowing this is beautiful and all thanks to the almighty you know this is wonderful okay tell me something why do you think spiritual growth is important for a professional and you know for the well-being for the professionalism and also what are the different services and therapies you are offering as I said initially, uh, Rashi, unfortunately, people only take wellness as going to the doctor when they are sick and when they are ill. 
but wellness and well-being is preventive and i want to hard you know uh, drive that into everybody's hearts and brains that please do not take wellness and well-being as curative so that's the first and foremost important point and how it can help it can help in everything and that's why the therapy that uh, got out of me for the work that i do it initially was angels uh, working with only angels and then one fine day in 2013 i got that angels are not a therapy we are by default there to help all of mankind and creation the therapy is for the soul which we are helping you to do and therefore the entire thing that was gifted to me was guided to be christined as soul therapy soul therapy readings guidance and soul therapy healings whereby the guidance is not just uh, prophetic or uh, you know uh, kind of prediction oriented oh this will happen when you are 30 years old what has that got to do what what pickle do i make out of that but it goes deep down to the root cause. So if somebody comes with a job problem or stressed with something or finances or marriage or whatever part of life that has ruffled and steered you, then it will guide you. Where is this energy coming from? Why have you manifested it? And what healing affirmations, prayers or lifestyle changes, mindset changes will help you to resolve and heal this matter? And then the healings of whatever is guided for that person are done. So wellness and well-being will help you to balance your energy centers in the body, will help you in your overall physical, mental, emotional health. It helps you through emotional releases, stress reduction, anxiety release and healing, anger healing, increased self-awareness. Today, with the tip of a finger, we know everything that's happening with Google Uncle. What is happening in Antarctica and North Pole and South Pole? But the least we know what is happening inside of us. And that's what therapy and helping and healing and energy work will do. Creating increased self-awareness. Then giving a spiritual connection to my own being. You cannot give that which you don't have. We all are trying to give out of our empty cups and thinking, oh, she's so ungrateful, man. I'm doing so much for her. But you are giving out of your emptiness. You cannot expect gratefulness, which is a heart-centric thing because it's not touched the heart and the soul. So all of these little things with enhanced intuition. Today, if you actually say intuition is not a woo-woo word, it is the very premise of every entrepreneur and head of a company. When they say, my gut feeling said it and I started this. <laughs> what is that gut feeling? It's intuition. It's happening from your gut. Because actually the spiritual reason, your gut or below your navel is the seat of the soul. It is the driving force of the life force energy, which resides in your spine. And it emits from there. And therefore, we call it colloquially gut feeling. So it will enhance your intuition in giving you clarity, a purpose-driven life, making you have habits and decision-making faculties opening up for you to do the right things at the right time being with the right people and in organizational format it will help in improved employee well-being as we discussed helping in stress management helping in goal achievements in uh, team dynamics enhancement leadership development cultivating like you know positive culture at the workspace and the list can go on the only thing is we have to be aware of what it is doing and thereby be open to imbibe it and give it a priority as I say and repeat right now uh, in so many of my posts, that wellness is not a choice. It is a necessity. And I pray that people wake up to that. So you as a social entrepreneur running this foundation, Meher Roshni Foundation. Meher again is a very, very beautiful word in itself like Roshni. So tell me, what does it do? And why is it important for all of us to indulge into small bits of social work? You know, people are takers. There are less givers in this world. So let's hear on more on this. Yes, Rashi, indeed. And that word Meher is very, very important and critical to my life and so many lives uh, as well that are in my circle and energetic life force circle. Mm -hmm. Meher also reverses as Rehen. Then read the other way. And that's what my life is all about. The grace and the mercy 
of the Lord that allows me to wake up each day and be of service. And for me, every day, Rashi, right uh, from the time that it started, there was this beautiful thing of my work also gave me happiness and joy. That's why in 104 Fever also, I could be on a shoot and work. And this happiness was different. And the reason that came when I woke up one day is that this happiness is different because I'm waking up to reading messages of about others getting happy after something is resolved, something is healed in their life. And that happiness is such a blessing because it is not self-generated. He's done it. I have only been that intermediary put into the right place at the right time. And when this all started, I had this impending question. Why would anybody come to me for spiritual, social work or anything? I've partied like crazy. I've been in this crazy industry. Who in their sane mind would come to me for spiritual guidance? And a beautiful thing after months came up in my channeling once when I was sitting in prayers. That when you bought your car, who looks after the car? You or the car itself? And I'm answering the voice in my head. I look after the car. And that that's exactly who you are. You are a vehicle for God and God will look after you. And do not worry about the passengers because neither the driver knows which passenger is going to sit in the car and neither the passenger knows which driver is going to come along. And that rested all my queries and concerns and questions. And I left it to God. Until date, I do not know from where clients have come. I've never literally put out an ad because I was not guided to put out an ad for my work as such. I would put out workshop dates earlier and so on, but it was primarily through my guided and channeled messages which still go on with over almost 3,000 videos uh, on social media to daily messages of showing up. People have called me crazy. People have called me who is bothered about all these positive things and things like that, but it was only to wake up and be of service and show up. You may still see that I may have one like, two likes or five likes. It has not mattered. The game of numbers has never mattered. I've done workshops with even two people sitting in it. So that has been grace. Because otherwise, the logical mind will always drive you into the materialism and drain you into it. Yes, materialism is important and spirituality and materialism are actually one. Because when this materialism is used as spiritual abundance, that's where the social entrepreneurship comes of receiving the spiritual abundance and recycling it back into the world. So my social entrepreneurship began with that. I've done sporadic things earlier, just manoga, kardia kind of a thing. But I thought if I want to do something big, there has to be an organization. So in 2011, I formed Meher Roshni Foundation with Meher being Meher Baba's name. And there is a book called Meher Roshni in the Baba community written by Bhau Kalchuri, who gave me the name. So uh, that's where the name emerged one fine day after the prayers to name the foundation. And earlier when we began, I didn't have money to register it and so on. But I said, just because I don't have money to register it doesn't mean good work should not happen. So I started doing events and started sending out messages event-based. And my workshop students were the first and today are still the key volunteers of our organization. They are called the sparkling angels earlier. So they are the sparkling angel volunteers. And even their children are embedded to do service. So since 2011, we have been doing something called the annual happiness event, which happens for 200 slum kids every year about. It started with 70 kids. And today we are at almost 200 since the last few years. And then in that day, kids are also got in to do the social service and volunteer so that they learn from that level, not just to volunteer, but they are made to play with the slum kids. They are made to exchange prizes and give prizes to each other, teach each other so that there is unity, there is harmony, there is no, uh, you know, uh, divisions and discriminations, which today drive the mindset of these young minds through everything that we elders do. So we began with that. And then in 2018, we uh, registered it because I was guided to do more larger work now. And it's time to go the next leap. And my dear friend was got about who supported 
in the fees for the registration that we needed and so on. And that's how we registered the organization and have been doing uh, with his grace only. People from nowhere have been coming and contributing and we may not be known or talked about uh, in the marketing zone, so to speak, but his grace has impacted thousands of lives. In through COVID has been our maximum work where his grace allowed that we supported 700 plus frontline workers and slum families with every two months of ration, medicals and so on for almost two and a half years over. And that's huge. We also were able to support with supplies to three, the you know, a small hospitals in Ratnagiri district in the Cape district, whereby an individual doctor friend had uh, driven the entire thing and a club of doctors started converting dilapidated schools in the village and made them COVID hospitals. And there we uh, gave medical supplies, oximeters, oxygen concentrators, and so on. So it has just been immense grace and mercy flowing all these years that we are able to do and today we have two key projects whereby in 2022 my dream of doing something in Mehrabad which is the Samadhi place of Aftar Meher Baba we started Meher Baba Children's Center which has today about 100 plus kids which get completely free of course medical shoes clothes education stationery food every day medical uh, support and everything of their overall holistic living is taken care by the center with the kind donations of few people. And now we call out to many more to support us because things have increased, number of children have increased. And our other dream, because it is on the belief that there's so many hungry mouths across the world. How many can you keep feeding? And my belief of teach them fishing rather than provide them fish all the time was always there. And I had shared it with uh, my dear friend Meghna Ghai in 2012 that something we are going to do together based on this. And it took 10 years in 2022 that our Life Skills Academy, which is the vocational training center, got set for uh, training programs in uh, beauty courses, nursing patient courses, laptop repair, mobile repair, and so on, which would give immediate uh, recruitment or at least give them the scope of beginning something from home. Today, mobile repair course, you can just start from home and start repairing mobiles from your locality and you know you start gaining money. So making them financially independent because people say it is illiteracy or being uneducated that is driving crime. I say no. It is first and prima facie, the roti kapda makan. The basic necessity is not being made available, which create crime. And then education and all of that is there. So that is my dream that we have Life Skills Academy tomorrow become a building. And we have it in every corner of uh, India where we are able to train rural people, village people into skill sets and help them enhance their lives and become self-sufficient, financially independent, and world citizens in their own right, in their own little world, wherever they are. And to your most important question on why individuals should indulge in some social work is that we all, as beings, we think that I'm giving this. Now, who gets happy the moment you have this thought? Who gets happy first? You. And therefore, in the spiritual essence, actually the receiver is bigger than the giver. Think about the aspect of going onto a road with five packets of food and nobody to give on the road. So the aspect of social service is serving yourself, actually. Serving the God within you. So the aspect of social service is serving yourself, serving God within you first, and then serving God within others. And it helps in the overall nurturing and harnessing the best in man. The best in every person. Because it drives a purpose to our life of waking up and sleeping every day. And it's not just about big things. As Meher Baba says in one of his quotes, a kind smile, a kind word, a sentence of appreciation, of not speaking harshly, not doing bad, not gossiping, not ill-treating people. That is charity as well. 
And besides money, the actual other charity also could be through your skills, through your talents, through your gifts, through volunteering time. And therefore, I would request and urge every individual, whatever you are passionate about, see the cause you are passionate about and allocate some time in your schedule to devote it to that passion of cause and service. Absolutely commendable work. This is, you know, I understand that you are highly spiritual, guided by the angels and, you know, listen to your inner voices, just listen to the universe. But what actually has been your success mantra? Over to you. Raja, I would rather say what has been my spiritual mantra. Because spiritual immunity is the strongest to be built. Then financial immunity, emotional immunity, physical immunity, mental immunity, all of that comes into that basket. So my spiritual mantra, which ultimately will lead anybody to success or has led me to so-called success for lack of words, I would say, is implicitly trusting the process of life. No questions asked. And to implement it. So in my new book, there is this theory part, which is there on how the aspect of the four key steps of life, beginning from awareness to implementation. So I am thankful to God for helping me with the courage, with the mindfulness, with the clarity and with the strength to implement the guidance because guidance you can get. What you do with it and how you put it into action and infuse your breath and life into it is what will create your life. And that is what it has done to me. And I would guide everyone that start harnessing your inner self, your inner connectedness, so that this intuition, this voice of God opens up for you as well and steers your life to the right path to be there at the right places with the right people and ultimately doing and living the purpose that you have ordained yourself to be. As people say, finding the purpose, finding the purpose, I would say, you live such a life that the purpose will find you. And that is what purpose has done to me. Bringing me from chaos to calm. Roshni Shehnaz, the spiritual, I would say, empowerist extends a helping hand on your journey to self-discovery through channeled guidance healing and mentoring she supports you with deep cleaning and transformation her details are available on the video get in touch with her and i'm sure everybody needs this roshni aapka bahut bahut thanks hai kiya pai